Hey, Jen, want to talk about recovering from a sexless marriage? This topic is dead. Great. Today, we're going to respond to a listener's question about struggling to recover from an infrequent and unhealthy sexual relationship. Let's do it. Welcome to the Intimate Covenant Podcast, where we believe the Bible and great married sex both belong on your kitchen table. That's right, we're talking about holy, covenant-bound, intimate relationships with hot sex. We're Matt and Jen, founders of Intimate Covenant. We offer biblical teaching and resources to help married couples achieve a fuller relationship and an extraordinary sex life. For more information, visit our website, intimatecovenant.com. Welcome, friends. Welcome. Thanks for joining us on the Intimate Covenant Podcast. Here we are again, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, sexless marriage. But before we get to that, we had a couple of important announcements. Yes, this this announcement is very important. I mean, crucial. Uh, <laughs> so if you've been uh, following along the last couple of episodes, um, we have been trying to come up with a creative name for our daily check-in exercise. Yes, we covered daily check-in. Uh, we've mentioned it multiple times Many in the times. podcast sure. and at every live event we've ever done. Did a whole episode about daily check-in a couple episodes back. Um, but we've said over and over, we hate the name daily check-in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just kind of weird it, what it came to be called. Um, yeah. But uh, we, we certainly think that there's something more creative out there. We just were stuck on what to call it. And you guys are creative. We heard yes. from a lot of you. Thank you so much to everybody who took the time to think up a name and send it in to us. We yeah. love that. Yes, thank you. Uh, we appreciate all the input and uh, for the, all the encouragement that you also have passed along yeah. in doing so. Uh, so we have three finalists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're narrowing we, it down for we, you guys. We couldn't really decide on just one of these. Yeah. Of the dozens, literally, of of suggestions that we got, mm -hmm. we've narrowed it down to three, and we want your input on what you think the best name is. Yeah. You're going to have a couple of ways to vote, so we're going to probably put up some social media polls we in, are. in the next week or yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, so certainly vote on the social media polls. If or you're not following us on social media, you can find us at, at Intimate Covenant on Instagram and Facebook. We're yep. there. We're there both, both places. We have to dig, but we're there. We're there. <laughs> um, vote on the social media polls or just send us an email and uh, let us know which name you think uh, works best, and we would certainly love to hear from you. We're going to decide on this hopefully by our next episode we'll have a big launch a oh, relaunch reveal yeah, it'll of be, the name it'll be so exciting right. what email address do they In, send that uh send it to podcast at intimatecovenant.com there you go okay so the top three top three do you Here have we a drum go. roll uh, I you don't, still don't have uh, a problem. I need to program that I in. mean yes. okay. it would be so much more exciting but here we go top okay. three covenant conversations Nice. I like. It uses a little bit of our name. Gets the idea across. Great. Okay. Second one. Connection point. Also good. I, I like, like it. Yeah. really focusing on the connection that yeah. could be happening in the in this daily check-in conversation. Yes. All right. right. And then the last one, a little bit of a quirk to it is quickie connection. So kind of fun little I, play on I, just, I love that too. Uh, all of this, uh, all three of these you, are you great. You say, hey, honey, you want to, let's talk. It's time for our quickie. Time for our daily quickie. Little, little wink, yeah. little, little love nod. That. Okay. Love that. Little innuendo. So those okay. are our top three. Okay. Covenant conversations, connection point, and quickie connection. So which one could you see yourself saying, you know, to your spouse, reminding one another, hey, it's time for, for that. Converse, daily conversation that we're going to have to better connect us to one another. What do you think? Love it. All right. Uh, so vote on, vote, uh, send us your email, uh, vote on social media. Yeah. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and, and wanna, right. we want to know what you think and let's, let's get something that works for everybody. That's right. All right. The other big announcement we have is we are coming to Tampa again. There we go. Tampa, uh, Tampa Marriage Day. Uh, we will be there March 2nd. 
Saturday, uh, March 2nd. Second, uh, all day from nine to four. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to be talking about redeeming your okay. intimate covenant. Uh, this is one of one of our favorite topics, Absolutely. one of our favorite themes. Good material. We've never presented this material at Tampa. Mm -hmm. So if you've come to our previous Tampa Marriage Days, this will be all new material. All new yep. stuff. Uh, we would love to see you there um, if you're in Tampa or the surrounding area. Um, you can uh, find some more details and registration at intimatecovenant.com slash Tampa. We hope you can enough. join us. All right. Okay. So getting into today's episode, Matt, um, today's episode is in response to a recent email re uh, question. Um, it's from an anonymous wife. Mm -hmm. um, just some details about her. It seems like she's in her late 20s and she's been married for a little more than five years. So a little context there. Um, so here was her email question. Hello, I've been listening for a while and your podcast has been helpful to me to redefine marriage and see it in the way God wants us to. Thank you for your hard work and sacrifices to make this happen. I'm writing in because I feel a little stuck in the way of progress at the moment. Since the beginning of our marriage, we have struggled to have sex consistently and on a regular basis. Some years we have probably had it less than once per month. But lately, we have been working on improving that. Recently, my husband made a comment out of frustration that I am so picky. This hurts because I have been really trying hard to be open to doing things his way. And when I tell him there is something I can't do, I tell him that after a lot of thought. I know women are different than men when it comes to sex, but I'm afraid that I could use that as an excuse. How do I know if I am being too picky and creating problems? Hmm. The that's uh, well. First of all, let, let's just back up. First of all, and just say we appreciate her willingness to look in the mirror. Yeah. Uh, and try to assess her role in the dynamic in their relationship that Absolutely. has led to this unhealthy and infrequent sexual relationship. Yeah, it's so easy to point our fingers at our spouse. Sure. And to lay blame on them. And th that there probably is blame on her husband's part. Of course. But I so appreciate the fact that this is, you know, she is coming at this from the standpoint of, I don't want to go there. Just how do I help fix this? How do I fix my part of this? And, you know, it, she's expressing that recently um, they together have been trying to improve it. And so it mm -hmm. seems like that has really caused her to do a lot of introspection and trying hard to figure out, you know, what part she plays. So I just really appreciate her willingness and th their willingness. And that is the essence of keep striving don't settle Absolutely. so well done yes, well to, done to this emailer um you're on the right track yes it, as long as you both are interested in trying to make it better and genuinely want what is best for each other then there is always real substantial hope for your relationship moving forward you've only been married for five or six years and so uh, you, you certainly have a lifetime left, really. I mean, look at us. We've been married for 26 years. So <laughs> you, you got a lot more time left to get this right and to yeah. struggle with each other in this process. So yeah, kudos I, to you. I have to wonder what would our email like this be at our five, six year you know, mark oh, our marriage. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it all, sounded very similar. Absolutely. Honestly. A anybody who yeah. um, has been married for any length of time has had periods and stages in your marriage where you're struggling, whether it's with sex or with anything else. Yeah. So um, thank you for writing in. Thank you for listening. Uh, yeah. and, you know, that, of course, also is a huge compliment to us. And thank you for trusting us with uh, this, this question. Right. So um, speaking of trying to improve. Yes. Uh, I want to ask everyone out there, did you reach your financial goals this past year? Oh, well, we're segueing into uh, <laughs> a little plug for our sponsor here. That's just, did you just a quick aside. Your financial goals. Are you afraid that next year will look a lot like last year? Or oh, maybe you're financial. maybe you're feeling hopeful for the new year, but you just don't have a solid plan to really make your family's financial goals happen. Mm -hmm. uh, does your financial future feel uncertain? Does it feel scary? Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, if you've been listening for any period of time, you know that we want you to know yes. our friend Derek Finley at Open Door Financial Advisors. Uh, Derek can help you regardless of where your situation is. If you have yeah. 
five million dollars or you have five dollars in your bank account mm -hmm. uh derek finley wants to help you solidify your financial future and i think that the best thing i mean you just made me think about this matt Derek is like a no judgment kind of guy. And I love that you so often, I mean, we ask all these questions uh, that were all emotion based because money and finances are so deeply ingrained with so for so many of us emotions. Yeah, and yeah. but Derek is so so a lot of us are ashamed or afraid to confront really. Uh, but Derek is not going to judge you. Derek is not going to get on to right, you. Right. Um, he's just there to help. He's so yeah. awesome at that. He, he just wants what's best for you, and he's going to educate you as well as give you um, solid expert advice mm -hmm. that fits your individual circumstance. It's not a cookie cutter approach. Um, obviously, he he's he's going to do a good job for you. So uh, find Derek, uh, opendoorfa.com, where finances meet faith and family. All right. Now to the main point of this episode, but let's first start. By making an important point, um, that's kind of a sub point of this full episode, and yes. that is early struggles with sex and relationship should not be ignored. I, we enter into marriage, so many of us thinking sex should just be natural. It should just happen. And, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. God approved. Nobody ever talks about it. So surely it'll just all work out. And it often most of the time doesn't but for some of us then there's so much shame that gets attached to those early struggles and it's real easy to just ignore that maybe you don't know who to talk to where to turn how to get help but when you ignore ignore those early struggles with sex and relationship it can very quickly devolve into something that is very toxic Oh yeah, uh, I mean, and this this email is a, is a perfect point. They she admits that they had struggles from the beginning in their relationship, and that devolved into a, a relationship where they're having sex less than once per month for years. And they've only been married for a little over five years. Yeah, so yeah. I mean that that really speaks to the point that these issues quickly get out of hand. And the problem is, and this is Satan's game here, that a lot of times it's shame. For, from wherever that may be coming from, shame uh, initiates that um, uh, th that devolvement. It, it initiates mm -hmm. the the conflict. Right. It initiates the apprehension. But then it's shame that wants us to just try to ignore it, continue to ignore it, continue to uh, let it devolve, let it just fester without addressing it, without looking at it, you know, face to face. Right. Uh, and so. You know, some important conversations early in their marriage, maybe even before they were married, right. uh, some important conversations could have saved years, literally in this case, years of pain, frustration, and the heaping on of this needless shame. So again, not the main point of this episode, but I think it is an important point that yeah. is worth uh, reiterating, especially for those of you that may be still young in your marriage. Um, that if there are issues, if there is conflict, if there is a uh, devolving of your relationship, right. uh, then that needs to be addressed early. Yes. Early. Yes. Do not think that this that somehow you'll just magically figure this out without any conversation, without any hard work, yeah. and, and you've got to address that right. Right. So the details of why they struggled with sex in their early marriage are probably important to best understand their current conflict, and then her internal turmoil. And obviously, we don't have all of those details. Right. Um, you know, the, the questions to ask is, is there a place where there has been past betrayal within their marriage? Are there other prior traumas that have happened to one or both of them? You know, are there other sources of sexual shame? Yeah, there's a lot of reasons why this could be going on. And obviously, we, like you said, we don't have all of those details, but I think we can make some safe assumptions. And I'll admit these are assumptions yeah. uh, to to a great extent, but we can make some assumptions about their relationship. And, and I want to be clear that the assumptions that we make about their relationship are not that we're casting blame no it's just the likely reality of their relationship dynamic and it got that way for 
probably good reasons. They each probably have good reasons for why they're acting and reacting the way that they are. Right. I doubt very seriously that they are reacting the way that they're reacting because they just purely want to make each other miserable. Right. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, that's an assumption that we're making, of course, but I think that's a safe assumption. Um, and we want to help them in, in doing this. We want to help them reframe the dynamic. Mm -hmm. We want to, to see where they are mm -hmm. and then reframe that dynamic and help them consider that maybe there are some different strategies right. to try to address this ongoing conflict that's in their marriage. So I think one of the important assumptions that has to be acknowledged is that his sexual initiation strategies are feel are pressuring to her yes. they feel pressuring right. to her now again maybe they should feel pressuring because maybe she needs to feel a little bit of tension in order to help her grow a little bit mm -hmm. uh, maybe that said his techniques or his ways of expressing his needs perhaps could use some refinement right. to help her feel more secure. So we're going to talk about that. Right. It seems also that she controls the sexual frequency and variety based on her own narrow comfort level, um, which she probably resents. I mean, so many responders resent being the gatekeeper, and yet that is the position that they hold, that they are the ones controlling, you know, what does and doesn't happen and when it does and doesn't happen and you know it sounds like she is admitted to i have a narrow comfort level mm -hmm. and therefore what we do has to fit right, right within my comfort level yeah th there's that term picky and we're going to probably mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit more mm -hmm. later but that that's it so you know again there is her she is the gatekeeper mm -hmm. she may appreciate that on some level, but on another level, she resents that. Uh, it right. sounds like, and, and that's, it sounds that's, like... Where, that's where her internal yeah. dialogue is occurring. Am right. I, am I being too picky? Am I causing or creating this problem? Right. And so then it seems like there's frustration on his part. Mm -hmm. Um, he's feeling rejected, yeah. um, due to her narrow boundaries. And that might just be his perception. She may not be actively trying to reject him, but that, her narrow comfort level feels like a rejection to him, which is causing then a, a buildup of frustration and maybe even then a buildup of, you know what, never mind, I don't even want it. Yeah. You know, a retreating on his part. That might be how he handles that feeling of rejection. Um, and, and obviously she is in a place of needing to and wanting to reassess her boundaries. Yeah, I think it's safe to assume that from from this email that she wants to know, should I be rethinking where I'm drawing some of my lines and where or why am I comfortable or uncomfortable in certain circumstances? Right. So, so, so let me, I guess let me first say, does any of this sound familiar? I mean, yeah. th this is these kinds of this circumstance, these um, relational dynamics are common maybe ubiquitous yeah. among married couples right? this is the challenge this is where you when you put two people together who will inevitably have different levels and degrees of comfortability with sex mm -hmm. and different levels of desire for either frequency or variety of sex mm -hmm. um, there's going to be this place of conflict so right. i think that what we we're not here just to try to solve their problems because I think when we look at this particular set of circumstances, this is applicable to, I think, every marriage dynamic. Absolutely. And again, I think if we were to have been the ones writing the email in our fifth, sixth year of marriage, there would have been a lot of common elements. Oh, absolutely. So, um, you know, maybe we say that to say to all of you who feel some connection to this, there's so much hope, you, it, you know, it, there's there's a lot to be gained. So I, I think because this is such a ubiquitous problem, uh, one, uh, one place where we could start with this is, I think for every marriage, for every um, pursuer responder dynamic, um, there is a fundamental truth that must be uh, true in your relationship mm -hmm. um, if we're going to begin to get momentum out of this uh, pressure and withdrawer kinds of scenario. 
because I think regardless of what the underlying problems are in the relationship, whatever the specific details of the relationship are, the fundamental criteria for a wife to want to have more sex or for a wife to want to have different sex is that the wife must have the expectation that there is going to be sex worth having. Yes. Yes. If that sex, if the sex being offered is not pleasurable, if it's not emotionally satisfying, um, then it's going to be hard to want to have sex. Um, so, you know, it, it, it the, that sex has to be, um, something that she wants, but she has to, she has to first start by wanting to yeah, have sex. It's nearly impossible to be motivated towards something that you, that is just has very little benefit to you. Right. Right. And so if she's not feeling motivated again, because it's, it's not pleasurable, it's not emotionally satisfying, it's or not free of shame. Yeah. Or perhaps it, it is causing pain uh -huh. or maybe it, maybe not just that it's not all that fun. It's like, you know, doing your homework, but maybe it actually is causing more pain more and suffering, pain. whether that's, that's right. emotional or physical or spiritual pain. Uh, if it's a source of pain, then there's going to be very little motivation, maybe no motivation. Perhaps the only motivation of the sex that they're having is actually to motivate her away from sex. Right, right. And so in order for her to want to have sex, she must be having sex worth having, yeah. which means she she needs to feel emotionally, spiritually, and physically safe Absolutely. within their sexual union. Absolutely. The, the sex that they're having must be mutually pleasurable, both emotionally and physically pleasurable uh, for the wife to be motivated towards that kind of sex. And, right. and the sex that they have then ultimately must leave her feeling more closely bonded to the relationship. Right. If those things aren't happening, then you're you're going to be spinning your wheels, so to speak, in terms of trying to get yourself or your spouse to yeah. be drawn towards doing it more or doing it differently. Right. Just putting your bodies together more frequently will not solve this problem. Mm -hmm. It is not just a matter of white knuckling yourself into having more sex. Yes. I've, I've certainly seen or heard advice or read advice from books uh -huh. that, you know, if, if you just have more sex, then the relation that will help to resolve some of the relational problems. And I don't think that's true. If you keep having bad sex, mm -hmm. it's going to make the problem worse, not better. Right. Right. And so both spouses have responsibility to meet these criteria, to meet that criteria of having emotionally, spiritually, physically safe sex, you know, pleasurable sex emotionally and physically, and sex that leaves you feeling closely bonded to one another, that has to be on the part of both of them. Well, I, I think that's an important point because when we say that, you know, she must be emotionally and spiritually and physically safe, we people will hear that and say and think, well, that's all on the husband. So this is the husband's fault. And so she's going to she's going to come back from reading or hearing our response and say, well, yeah, I was right. It is my husband's fault. And that's not what we're saying. Uh, when I say that the sex must be mutually pleasurable, then what people hear is, oh, the husband's doing a bad job. He should do more foreplay and that will fix his problem. And that's not necessarily true, because if she doesn't want to be there, then she then no matter what he does, she's mm -hmm. not going to be able to enjoy it. So, it, again, it, this is on both of them to create co-create i think that's an important term here underline that in your transcripts <laughs> co-create they must both be engaged and invested in co-creating a sexual experience that will be mutually pleasurable that will mm -hmm. be mutually emotionally bonding right right so I think more on the mutual responsibility in a minute, but first I want to unpack a particular phrase that she mentioned in her email. It says, recently my husband made a comment out of frustration that I am so picky. Mm. This hurts because I've been trying really hard to be open to doing things his way. And when I tell him there is something I can't do, I tell him that after a lot of thought. I know women are different than men when it comes to sex, but I'm afraid that I could use that as an excuse. How do I know if I am being too picky and creating problems? So I want to kind of unpack that idea of too picky. In her words, her husband has described her as being too picky. So what, what does that mean to be too picky? 
Um, is it true? It, it Right. I, I think that, I mean, maybe that is true. Sometimes the question reveals the answer in a lot of these cases. Right. That's a lot of times what we find in, uh, in, in our experience when we talk to couples. But um, what does that mean to be too picky? Yeah. And I think that is a good question. And is it true? Mm-hmm. And I don't know that we can answer that because clearly we don't have enough details to answer that. Right. But I, I do want to maybe go follow this conversation a little bit further. Right. Um, and help her hope maybe answer this question for herself. And maybe maybe just as importantly, you as a listener also need to go down this road. Am I being too picky yeah, uh, right. in, in, in some of these situations? So I think in order to kind of try and flesh out what does that mean to be too picky, I'm guessing it, what really is behind that is that she's saying no to something. Mm-hmm. That's where he's he's deeming this as a place that she is too picky. So right. the question to ask is, what's the reason for saying no? And so maybe some possible answers. Again, we don't know her. Right. Uh, we don't know you. But we want you to dig into why do I say no to something? So here's some places where it could possibly be coming from. Are you saying no because of spiritual shame? Whether that's appropriate or not. Um, is your no coming from a place of your own poor body image and you just can't put yourself in that vulnerable of a position because of how you feel about your actual body? Do, does that act leave you feeling too vulnerable, too exposed? Yeah. Um, and, and why is that? I mean, yeah. is it because of your own internal uh, past and maybe past traumas or because mm-hmm. The way that your husband treats you do you feel too vulnerable to reveal yourself to your husband Um, at all sexually let alone in a one particular act you know right um is there physical pain involved in in what it is that's being asked of you um or do you just in general have physical pain with a lot of sexual acts that you've never dug into never Mm -hmm. been willing to really figure that out um i think a lot of reasons why a woman feels an initial sense of no towards a husband's request is oftentimes there is a suspicion of his motives. I I wouldn't have thought that up. So where did he get that idea? Mm. Where has he seen this before? Interesting. Has he wanted to do this? You know, so just trying to figure out his motives. Sure. Um, Is it that you feel emotionally detached in all of your marriage, in all of your relationship, And because there's not a strong emotional attachment to one another, you're unable to then kind of get outside your comfort zone when it comes to a physical um, act or um, position or whatever it may be. You know, is there maybe a fear of not being adequate? So when it's something you've never done before, you can definitely feel a sense of, I'm not going to do that right. You think, there's a right way to do that, and I'm inexperienced. I won't know the right way to do that, and I will leave him feeling disappointed. Sure. And so I don't think I'm enough to be able to yeah, do that. I, I think a lot of folks struggle with insecurities on various levels and for various reasons, but some of us are just naturally feel more insecure mm-hmm. with the unknown. And so... Um, well, and that can be it, just a fear of the unknown. Mm-hmm. We naturally revert to no simply because it's unknown. Yes, right. That, that, I have a whole for, podcast all by myself about that yeah, topic. Sometimes that, yeah, that, I mean, that for some of us, the unknown is a it's, place for adventure, and that sounds fun for others. If it's unknown, it, it, that's like the default is no. If I don't uh-huh. know, if I can't uh-huh. predict the outcome, mm-hmm. the answer is no. Uh, so, so you yourself have to lean into why am I saying no, mm-hmm. you know, and only she can answer that question. And that answer is probably layered. It's probably not, oh, yes, that's the one answer. It's probably layered with complexities it, and it's going to be tied into the general relationship dynamic. Oh, absolutely. It, this is not just a sex problem. Th- this is all about the relationship. And right. I think that's one important point here. This is not a sex problem. Mm-hmm. Th- there's no such thing as dealing with just a sexual problem in your right. relationship because it bleeds over and it is influenced by 
uh, all of the complexities of mm -hmm. your relational dynamic. How are the two of you communicating together? Are you communicating? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have an open communication in your relationship or is there uh, this overwhelming sense of pressure or fear or dominance or avoidance, uh, you know, all those different factors that play in this. And so that kind of leads into this next, you know, place that I would push into is just, is there conversation? Right. Um, so she says, you know, when he asks for something, I tell him there is something I can't do. I tell him that after a lot of thought and if I was in the same room with this wife, I'd wrap my arms around her and give her a great big old hug and say, that's not a good enough. Because what you're saying to me in that sentence is, that was all a decision you made inside your own head. I tell them after a lot of thought, meaning you didn't involve him in a conversation mm -hmm. about this. So does she just get to consider it and act or reject on the invitation based on her own self-determined criteria and preferences if so you're not building a relationship yeah you're just making your own decisions that does not mean that there's not a valid reason to say no not right now that particular act i'm not comfortable with however you should only be reaching that conclusion after some conversation together I, as a couple. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, uh, what I'm hearing, and again, this may not be actually what's happening in the relationship. We and are not sitting on the couch beside we're, them. We're <laughs> probably oversimplifying this a little bit. But again, I think for the sake of the conversation mm -hmm. that we're having uh, here um, is what I'm hearing is that he's proposing something like, hey, babe, we should try X, Y, Z. And his method of proposal and might be... And she's like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, I got I to gotta think about this. I don't know. And she's hearing this even outside probably of the context of the bedroom. So there's not even any, you know, sexual energy to help kind of formulate this. She's hearing this out of context. Then she's making a decision after a lot of thought, which I think is we appreciate that she's reasonable. she's she not, isn't just react just reacting with no and then never thinking about it again. Sure, maybe she it's not thinking. maybe it's not an immediate no. She's willing to at least consider it, but then she's like, well, I've thought about it. Nah, I don't think this is for me. Rather than I think what we're proposing is there needs to be a conversation. Right, because what you want to know is that to every decision that you make as a couple in regards to your sexual relationship, that that is a we decision. Mm -hmm. It has to be that. So his voice matters. And this is what as much this as is what we mean by co-creating. It's not yeah. just like, OK, you you get a vote and I get a vote. And then because I said no, then that the end of discussion, yeah. you know, move on to the next I, uh, agenda item. So the question to ask her is, you know, have you really thought about it from his standpoint? And is he able or willing to explain his desires? Maybe he isn't willing. Maybe he's just proposing an act in the moment, but isn't actually wanting to have a conversation about it. If so, that's a place to, to push back a little bit. Sure. This needs to be a conversation. So he must be willing to explain what's behind his desire. Yeah, if he can't explain why then it's just not important enough for conversation probably and he shouldn't be getting his feelings hurt if it's if he can't explain why this would be important right. to him but also is she willing or able to hear his express sure. him express his desire so has he you know has there been rejection mm -hmm. on on in any level of the conversation part of this and if so that's a place that needs some mending um and you know as you were going through that little scenario a kind of threw it out there there but how's he presenting this proposition right it's the timing matters greatly if she is a classic responder then most likely she does not necessarily want the very first time she's ever heard about this to be 30 seconds before he wants her to do this <laughs> right <laughs> that yes. said you did bring up like okay but sometimes it's good to present it in a moment where there is some anticipation, some arousal mm -hmm. already built up. We're way more likely to say yes when we're already in a place of arousal. So that means what multiple conversations yes, exactly. should be had. Exactly. You need to be having the conversations completely outside mm -hmm. 
where you're defining what is and isn't okay right now. Mm -hmm. And that can always change. Be willing to to change, obviously, within the realms of what God has said yes to. Right. So you need to have those conversations at, you know, date night. But then you also need to be open to con conversing even in those moments. But it's it's lots and lots of conversations. It's not just one. And I would just add, you know, how he handles that rejection will say a lot about what his motives are. Yes. How he handles that rejection will say a lot about whether she's even willing to consider it in an objective way. Right. Is well. he looking for connection or is he looking just to check the next, you know, hot new thing off of his list? Yeah. And, exactly. and really, I, I think. You know, in, in a big part of what we're saying is that this the conflict about sexual frequency, the conflicts about sexual variety absolutely are going to require an ongoing conversation right. between the two of them. And it also requires a commitment from each of them to have as much connecting sex that is sex worth having mm -hmm. it's going to require that commitment from each of them to have as much connecting sex as necessary to continue to promote the oneness that is required in the relationship right and so she you know in her email tells us that almost from the very beginning she recognizes they've not been having enough sex and she says sometimes you know as little as once a month well you know people always want to know how much sex should we have? How are we normal? <laughs> Which we actually did a podcast yeah, episode. True. I think it's episode 50, right yeah, around there. 50. Are we normal? But that's the question we all have. How much sex should we be having? Well, we're here to tell you that according to the experts who study marriage relationships, once a month is not enough. Yeah. In fact, once a month uh, would be determined as a sexless marriage. And that's and the think, reason for wait, the title of the episode. Having, we're having sex. It's not that it's never there, but once a month is actually falls within the realms that experts call sexless because once a month is not connecting sex. Correct. Correct. Um, so this conversation requires that each of you must be able and have the opportunity to express their feelings. So not only do you need to have the opportunity, but you also need to be willing and mm -hmm. eager to express your feelings, your honest, transparent, vulnerable, true feelings right. about what this relationship looks like to you. But then I think the other part of that is being willing to hear and sit in your spouse's perspective. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot. For yeah. some of us, it takes a lot to just start explaining why we feel the way we feel, digging into that. But it's a whole nother ball game when we really force ourselves to sit in the perspective of my spouse. Yeah, this conversation is not a competition about whose feelings are more mm -hmm. valid. Mm -mm. Uh, this con this is a conversation about trying to understand my spouse's feelings. Right. So that means I'm going to express my feelings in a honest and transparent way, but I'm also going to stop and sit and really dig deep to try to understand what my spouse is feeling in this moment. And uh, within that, I think that the heart of that, Matt, is service yes. to one another. And each of you need to be committed to serving the other. So where does this start for this couple that wrote in? Well, it starts by recommitting yourselves to service to one another. Um, that's where it all begins. Mm -hmm. it, it is not that I'm here to get my way and be happy. It right. is that I am here to serve you, yes. my beloved. Ab absolutely. And then each must be willing to hold their spouse accountable mm -hmm. and to be held accountable. Whatever it is that is harmful behavior in this relationship, whether right. I'm the one who's perpetuating that, whether my spouse is the one that's perpetuating that, we each need to be willing to say, look, Sometimes I don't see what I'm doing and I need you to hold me accountable when I'm approaching this in an unhealthy way. Right. Um, and then be willing to be honest with myself. When I'm doing this, then I need to back up and behave in a way that's going to be more productive uh, and more beneficial to the relationship. Right. And, you know, it, sex is hard work. And so it could be that this couple has just settled into this place of it's too hard. Mm -hmm. And they both are choosing to not have the uncomfortable conversations, even moments 
of choosing sex. And so you need to start holding each other count accountable towards even the amount of sex that you're having. Um, you know, th this isn't about trying harder to do things his way or her, or for her to not be picky. It's an ongoing conversation about co-creating a sexual relationship that is beneficial for both of you. This is a we problem. Right. It's this not about, not... yeah, it's not about doing things his way or doing things my way. Mm -hmm. It's about doing things our way and finding out what works best for our uh, relationship. And I think al along those lines, and maybe where this gets a little bit more practical and hits a little bit maybe closer to home for this wife, mm -hmm. is that there are some important questions that she needs to be able to answer in order to have this conversation. Yes. And, and frankly, every wife well, needs sure. to challenge herself to answer these questions. And that is, can I describe a sexual encounter that would be worth having? Mm. So for her, what is her ideal scenario? It is so. And we're not just talking her... about an act. We're talking about the entire, entire sexual encounter. What, and what does the relationship feel like that in order to lead me into mm. that sexual encounter? It is so easy for women to just not think about sex. But if if you want to fix this, it begins in your own mind. And that is making yourself be vulnerable enough to think about sex. So you have to start wanting to have sex. So what would it look like? What is your ideal scenario? And then is there some room for expansion within that scenario? What would be required for you to begin to feel comfortable with expanding your boundaries? Now, obviously there are boundaries put firmly in place by God. Mm -hmm. And that is the two of you no third parties and you're better in your head. We like to say, yep. you know, it is sex that is not painful emotionally or physically. It is, you know, all about sex. that's mutually, connecting. mutually pleasurable and connecting. Th those are the hard and fast, you know, those are the boundaries, but so we're not asking her to expand outside of those boundaries, right. but, but within those, there's a, a, a great big old box of what we can do together as a couple within the boundaries God has put in place. Our challenge to all of us is how do we expand that just a little bit more? How do you get outside your comfort zone when especially you have a spouse that has a bigger comfort zone than you? How do you serve your spouse in that way? So what would be required for you to feel comfortable expanding your boundaries? And I'm guessing that what will make her feel more comfortable in her sexuality has very little to do with what's going to happen in the bedroom, mm -hmm. but this is probably going to be something that will occur in their relational dynamic and, in general. And maybe even her understanding of sex. Has she grown up with a very ultra conservative mindset from the standpoint of she thinks that there is just specific acts? Um, but we would, I mean, we've got a million episodes sure, sure. <laughs> to challenge that thought, but uh, you know, ask, Ask yourself as a wife, what is required of my husband? And what is it that I want from my husband? And can I express this in a way that motivates him versus rejecting him? That's a huge, huge point. Yeah. You never want to express what it is you're asking your spouse to do in a way that rejects, it, in a way right. that harms. Um, how about we look at this as a in a way that motivates. Yes, right, right. And then I think she's got to ask some questions of herself. What's going to mm -hmm. be required of me mm -hmm. in order to be able to be more comfortable, to find more pleasure in our sexual relationship? What's going to be required of me to uh, maybe think about expanding yeah. my narrow boundaries? Um, is she going to be willing to do what it takes to lean into that vulnerability to lean into that fear yes. and find some ways to expand their relationship uh, in a way that is still mutually beneficial right. uh, to both of them. And asking all these questions may bring up more questions. Uh, yes, it will. And Absolutely, it will. <laughs> don't be afraid of that. But just also recognize that if there are big blocks here, 
then therapy might be very helpful, whether that's individual therapy and or couples therapy. Um, and we would encourage that if, if this is a place where the two of you, one or both of you have big blocks against having a healthy relation that is preventing you or from this, having or, a healthy yeah, sexual Or if these conversations just kind of end up going in circles, uh -huh. then that's where a good therapist mm -hmm. can help see where those blocks are in your in you personally and in the relationship and can help you work through those blocks to get to a place where your conversation can progress right. and therefore your growth and your relationship can progress. Right. All right, I think we answered her question. Let us know if you have more thoughts about it. But for now, Matt, give us our wrap up. Struggles with sex in a marriage must not be ignored. Intervention and difficult conversations can save literally years of suffering and shame and even save the marriage itself. The fundamental criteria for a wife to want more sex or to want different sex is that the wife must have the expectation of sex worth having. And finally, the conflict of sexual frequency and or sexual variety requires an ongoing conversation and a commitment from each to have as much connecting sex as necessary to promote oneness in the relationship. Now it's time to grab your spouse and your Bible and head to your kitchen table to have the conversation about co-creating your sexual relationship. What are you going to do to have sex that is worth having? We'd love to hear your feedback. Certainly there's something that we left undone with this episode and we would love to hear what you think about it and how we could express and how we could cover this topic maybe more thoroughly. Contact us by emailing the podcast at podcast at intimatecovenant.com or go to the uh, website intimatecovenant.com slash podcast and you will find a form to submit an anonymous feedback submission. Thanks again to Derek and Open Door Financial Advisors for sponsoring the podcast. Contact Open Door at opendoorfa.com where finances meet faith and family. Thanks to all of you for listening, subscribing, rating, and sharing the podcast. We're truly humbled by your encouragement and your support. Thanks especially to our Patreon subscribers for coming alongside us in a very real way. We love you. If you would like to join Intimate Covenant by supporting the podcast in our greater mission to share God's plan for intimate marriage and holy sexuality, subscribe at patreon.com slash intimate covenant. And don't forget, go vote on our poll for the daily check-in name. Love it. Until next time, keep striving and don't settle.